here with um, EMSA, and we just want to let you know that this meeting will be recorded. Well, that sounded kind of funny. <laughs> this meeting will be recorded. Um, so if you want to keep your cameras off, um, that's totally fine. Um, so, okay, we'll go ahead and get started. Again, my name is Yesenia, and um, along with me, Melissa, Jade, who is not currently here, Oscar and Courtney, um, we team together to bring you this uh, amazing event. So um, to start off, we kind of just want to talk a little bit about Mi Mentor. Um, so go ahead and next slide, please. <laughs> So who is Mi Mentor? So Mi Mentor um, was developed, you know, with this idea, this mission to um, create a space where we would develop and support innovative mentorship opportunities. And this is to help inspire the next generation of um, healthcare leaders. So we really want to create a more diverse uh, workforce in the healthcare field. And so that's where Mi Mentor uh, came in. And so we envision a world where all aspiring and current health professionals, they all have a mentor to really get that guidance and support throughout this difficult path, you know, whether it's to medical school, um, through residencies, like to through nursing uh, programs, PA programs, um, the mentor is wanting to help um, everyone reach their goal. So who is Mi Mentor? So Mi Mentor is made up of two boards, um, the executive board and then the Alliance and Mentorship Board. And so the executive boards, um, there are three different regions. So we have the Central Cal region, the Southern California, Northern California, we do have a board in Georgia. So we're expanding um, over the past few years. So this board, like the, this side of Mi Mentor is all student ran. So we have a lot of um, students who are current undergrads, graduates, Students, um, we have our chief mentoring officers um, that really help support these events. And uh, a lot of us uh, during our gap years, you know, we commit and volunteer all this time to help bring events um, like this one. And so the Alliance and Mentorship Board is made up of physicians mainly, and they help support us um, as students to, to really help us with finding funding, you know, getting these grants to um, pay for uh for our mighty networks app hopefully everybody here has a profile um and so it's a it's a great environment we definitely collaborate a lot and work together to make this happen so really quickly we love to thank our I mean, our supporters so we have a lot of um uh, groups and organizations that you know help us with funding. We have Ultimed, UC Davis um, Medical School. We have the um, the the padrinos and madrinas. You know different positions who help support um, uh, mentor. So thank you all so much for your contribution. And so I'll go ahead and introduce our speaker for tonight, um, Dr. Cesar Padilla. And again, thank you so much, Amsa, for uh, collaborating with us in this um, uh, event. All right. Okay, for me to start? Go for it, yeah. Perfect. All right, so thank you so much for the very kind introduction. And let me share my slides first. Just let me know if everything looks okay, yes? Looks okay, good. perfect. Oh, all right, excellent. Okay, so um, I just wanna give a, start off by saying thank you to AMSA and Amy Mentor for this amazing opportunity. Uh, today I will be discussing uh, the topic of uh, medical anthropology, but through the perspective of indigenous um, uh, indigenous health. So the title of my talk is From the Aztec Empire to Present Day, an Anthropologic View of Maternal Health in the Indigenous and Present-Day Hispanic Population. My name is Cesar Padilla. I am a clinical assistant professor at Stanford University School of Medicine. A little bit about myself. Um, you all are so kind in inviting me to part of your day. And so, um, you know, I'll tell you a little bit uh, about myself. So uh, that we'll hopefully give a little bit of context. So I am an anesthesiologist by training. I am um, I'm triple boarded. So I have an anesthesia you know, certification. I completed a obstetric anesthesia fellowship and then another fellowship in critical care echo. And my whole idea was I wanna work with um, patients that are critically ill and pregnant because 
as you'll see in, in the talk, uh, we have a crisis in the United States uh, where we have an increase in maternal deaths in the US. And uh, we have basically a sicker patient population in OB. I am also the Hispanic Center of Excellence Fellow. Uh, it's a grant that's awarded through the um, Health and Human Services Department through the government at um, local institutions. I was just awarded that this year, and um, I also serve on the board for AMA Mentor. I have no financial disclosures. But to tell you a little bit about who I really am is I am uh, almost a, or a high school dropout. I stopped going to high school in the 10th grade. I grew up in Northern California. My parents are Mexican immigrants, and it was a rough environment being in a low-income public school setting. And I am a product of public schools, and the good side of the public schools are that you have second chances. And one of those second chances is adult school. So I had the chance to go to Fremont Unified Adult School to make up my credits because I had a 0 0.6 GPA in sophomore uh, year. And in order to make up your credits and graduate on time, well, you need to go to adult school. So from there, went to Ohlone College and ultimately met school residency and finished up my OB and critical care fellowships at Harvard. And the reason I am mentioning this to all of you is because don't, I don't want you to feel like your circumstances uh, should limit you, especially for those of us who were, were the first ones in our family to become physicians or our parents are immigrants or we're low socioeconomic, um, you know, come from low so socioeconomic backgrounds. Don't let that define you. There are opportunities and through the power of mentors, you will find those opportunities. So what do I do as an OB anesthesiologist, OB anesthesiologist and critical care physician? Because this is really gonna give that context into this talk. I've really had to think about this question because I'm more than just a proceduralist than you could think, okay, I do epidurals and I do spinal anesthesia for women in the critical care world. I intubate sick, uh, you know, sick patients. But beyond that, because we have medical uh, students in the audience, I'm an advocate for patients. And it's almost like a realization that I that, that came upon me really after thinking about what is it that we do? And it's a good exercise. What is it that you do? What defines you? And I think that's a, one of the purposes of me pursuing medicine is uh, becoming an advocate for patients. So we'll start off with the personal journey, a personal journey of sort of my background and my family. So this is a farm in... Um, in the state of Jalisco where my family is from. My great grandparents um, owned the farm and there's really no longer, it's not part of our family anymore. But one of the earliest stories I heard from my family growing up was that my great grandmother died after childbirth and she died after giving birth to her only child, which is my paternal grandfather. So my family lineage was almost, that's it. It almost ended there. And uh, she died shortly after childbirth. No one really knows the reason. Um, and I had the chance a few summers ago to go visit this farm and just really walk around and feel that energy and that atmosphere. Um, so part of the story is discovering who we are, discovering who we are through our culture, discovering who we are through our heritage. And this is one of those stories that sort of was the inception of my understanding of who I am because I heard the story growing up. And I never really thought about it much that it lived in the back of my mind all this time that I was going through medical school and training. This is really what's left of the farm. And even then it's these old adobe bricks. It's beautiful, right? To look at, it's just almost poetic. So here are learning objectives. Our learning objectives are to discuss the Aztec and Maya iconography, uh, religious symbols and their relation to maternal health. We're also gonna discuss the Aztec and Maya views on maternal health and gender roles discuss modern interpretation of these, uh, of these figures and discuss how pre-Hispanic, Aztec and Maya indigenous culture can provide a framework for addressing current day racial disparities in OB. For purposes of sort of um, just giving you guys a heads up of which cultures I'm gonna be describing the most, it's gonna be the Aztec, which is on the left side of the screen and the Maya. I will also briefly mention Northern, uh, Northern American Canada sort of um, interpretations of indigenous health, but I'll be focusing on these two, which uh, encapsulates most Central America and Mexico, and even by extent, also parts of uh, North America. 
So we'll start in the Aztec Empire. What happens at the moment of pregnancy? A lot of this information comes from codexes. So codexes are, you could think of like these declarations that the most powerful people in the empire had. And so they would draw basically what was happening. Think of hieroglyphics from the, uh, from the ancient Egyptians. So at the moment that um, it was discovered that a woman was pregnant, there was many speeches given. It was a big deal. It was a community event. This involved the most important elder. And I underline this word elder because I want us to come back to that. Deceased ancestors would be called upon to protect the child, which is interesting because there was this manifestation that we are, that this, this new life is a manifestation of what was, which is very fascinating. And the last quote is the child was, that the um, mother was carrying was a gift from the gods is important because it gives the value of the life, the value of what is to come. And the way that really Aztec, Mayan, and a lot of uh, Mesoamerican uh, native indigenous tribes honored was through iconography. So uh, there were multiple god goddesses that were sort of protectors of everyday life, if you will. And one of these was Donantzin. So Donantzin is Mother Earth. Think of Mother Earth. It's a, it's a broad statement that, uh, or a broad uh, has a definition of what that, that means. So Mother Earth. But Mother Earth has many personalities. So Donantzin is also referred as Siwakwatl. Siwakwatl is a goddess associated with fertility, childbirth, midwives, and also the, um, a goddess um, like of a woman snake. So it takes on this multiple, uh, I almost think of it like uh, personalities. So Donantzin is Mother Earth, Mother Protector. And within Donantzin, we have interpretations such as Siwakwatl. So these two terms are going to uh, arise during our talk. And you can see here that Donantzin is holding two, uh, two children and she has this band across her, uh, her waist. So we'll come back to that as well. So the pregnancy carries on and now is the moment of birth. So moments of birth were community events women gave birth alongside or with the assistance of a midwife. So midwives were incredibly important. So much so that they were part of, at least through the readings that I've been through, uh, they were part of most, if not all births. So what happened then, there was this sort of um, community rallying around a pregnant woman. And women in childbirth were considered warriors. And this is well documented. A battle cry was actually given. The same battle cry that was given in a victory of war was given when a baby was born. So there is already this sort of um, parallel, let's say, or equal importance to men who were at battle and a pregnant woman. And this is a theme that comes up in the Aztec Empire where women were seen as equal as men though interdependent, if that, you know, not the same, but different. And what that led to was a lot of rights that women in the Aztec empire were um, privileged to, such as owning property. A woman can actually uh, file for divorce in the Aztec empire. And these are, these are things that we think of as modern that sort of came about from the women's rights movements, like actually, you know, almost a thousand years old, if not even more that existed well-documented within the Aztec empire. So it doesn't come as a surprise then that women were sort of very highly valued at the moment of birth because of uh, the reasons that I mentioned. And so if you think about it from sort of an analogous standpoint, um, you know, we think of modern countries as sort of, um, you know, the value that they place on, on the army, for example, on armed forces, and what the Aztecs were literally doing were equating sort of a, a faction of that, of the national security to maternal health. So this is already an important sort of um, distinction of the, Aztec, uh, of the Aztec empire. But beyond this, what does the science, what does the evidence show us of, of the Aztec and Maya culture? So I'm gonna incorporate now some Maya culture as well. Mayan childbirth occurred in steam houses or steam baths. That was for most um, Mayan pregnant women. That was the standard practice. And 
For Aztec women, it would happen if the childbirths were difficult. Now let's take a step back because what I'm saying is, you know, there's, there's, there's things behind what I'm saying that are important. The concept of a hospital, meaning sick people go to a building was not invented in the United States until about 1750. Before that, what would happen is you had to make, uh, the doctors would go to people's homes, basically. It was like a home call kind of thing. So this concept of placing high-risk patients, at least for the Aztecs and all pregnant women in this sort of place where there were midwives and where there was a specialization to care, well, that's the definition of a hospital. And so that is sort of one of the realizations that, that came about for me just investigating this and this research is that they were very strict about sort of these practices. And it's not just a steam house per se, why? So let's ask ourselves why. And we have our, our, um, our quote up here or our uh, reference up here that uh, is from the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. So what's fascinating is that the steam baths served the purpose. This is where midwives were in attendance and they would examine if pregnant woman was breech. Of course, breech would present a very, um, you know, uh, it, it would present a lot of harm for the mother. And there was also these concepts of sterility, medical steriliz st sterilization in the sense of cleanliness. Again, a concept that really does, didn't emerge in Western medicine until um, the late 1800s. It was Lewis Pasteur who was, uh, was sort of credited for that. But there is this concept of sterility in the Aztec Empire, in the, in the Mayan Empire as, as well. There was also medicines for menstrual pains, difficult births, and this concept of heat that I want to go back. So why a bathhouse? Why, you know, you basically put fire under stones, you put water, you evaporate water, get to very high temperatures. So why would this be the case, right? We have to ask ourselves, well, there's actually science behind that. These are modern studies looking at, this is a randomized uh, clinical trial looking at the effect of heat on the sacrum per, uh, perineum on labor pain. And the results are uh, quite astonishing that there is less pain when heat is applied and there's greater patient satisfaction. And beyond that, there's also evidence that the utilization of heat actually shortens the second stage of birth, which is from full cervical dilation until the baby's born. So you have these concepts that really exist uh, in the well-documented in the pre-Hispanic indigenous world in very influential empires. And why is that important to mention? Well, because the Nobel Prize in medicine was just awarded two weeks ago for the concept of heat and touch on pain. And so we see this sort of, the, the steam in medicine where indigenous contributions are uh, ignored. Now these are well-documented. There are codexes, there are pictures of pregnant women, pictures in, you know, I, I cannot, drawings of pregnant women uh, delivering in bathhouses. And we see how, ahead, how much ahead of the time, uh, uh, you know, this, the, their science was. And not just with the concept of heat, but sterilization, as I mentioned, breech babies, really this awareness for maternal health. Now, of course, you can imagine without, um, you know, modern technology, if you will, uh, there was, uh, a, there were a lot of women that died in, in childbirth. Now, although these numbers are not well known or understood, uh, it was an unfortunate sort of consequence of the, of the time. Now, if I told you that a pregnant woman giving birth was equated to a soldier in battle, so there was a victory cry, but if a woman died, she was actually given the same respect and ritual as a soldier who died in the battlefield. This, a maternal death was considered, uh, was considered sort of, again, sort of this, this, this tragedy from a community standpoint, from a societal standpoint. Patients were, or uh, the women were given a warrior burial and their body became divine. So much so that their bodies were thought to be, um, to hold powers if a woman died. And so um, there was this, you know, you had, 
pregnant women who had died, their bodies were protected for, for several days after they died. So the bodies became divine. There was, again, we see this sort of respect in life and this respect in death, which is very uh, important. And let's really think about that from an anthropological standpoint. What does that mean? So who do we award our warrior sort of uh, tributes to? The Purple Heart, right? We think of the Purple Hearts, soldiers who were injured, died in battle, and sort of showed incredible honor. They received the Purple Heart. Well, that's the same thing. It, it's basically saying that we would give a pregnant woman who died uh, the same honor as a soldier in modern day sort of perspective. So these, these uh, women would receive a Purple Heart. And so this is what the pictures show us. So what I'm pointing to here in the green arrow is a pregnant woman. We see her represented twice in two different uh, pictures. And on the left here is a soldier protecting the woman. So the woman is, uh, the pregnant woman is in a bathhouse. So this is a bathhouse. You can see the rocks on the bottom. So she's in a steam house being protected by um, an Aztec soldier. Um, and again, this just shows the immense respect that was shown for a pregnant woman is sort of this protection of, of, um, of life. Now, this is from the Codex called the Codex Barbonicus. And if you look at the days 1507, this is before the arrival of the Spaniards. So this, this is important for the following reason, because it's one of the last codexes, well, it's actually the last codex before the arrival of the Spanish. Um, so this was done completely within the own realm of the Aztec empire or the Aztec influence. The other reason I want to mention this is because look at the name. So Codex Barbonicus, okay, doesn't really, you know, um, you can say uh, it doesn't ring a bell, uh, you know, at, at first uh, glance. There are actual historians and scholars that want to rename this codex because this codex, which again, imagine a codex being almost like uh, more, it's an important document that the emperors would even have in their own, in their own stations to read in their own homes to read. So think of it almost like a constitution. It's like, this is what our society stands for. This codex was uh, mentioned maternal health so much. So maternal health was so central to this codex that scholars actually want to rename it. Now, what did they want to re uh, rename this to? Siwakoatl or Tonantzin. So now we see Tonantzin making a comeback. I mean, these are scholars that are saying this. Again, because the concept of maternal health is so central in this codex. Uh, the name of the, uh, the papers here, renaming the, the Mexican co uh, codexes. So this, again, you know, we see this reemergence of maternal health that even scholars today are acknowledging. So let's go back to Tonantzin, or the honor, honored mother who takes on this sort of multiple manifestations. Uh, one of them I mentioned, uh, Siwakwat. This a figure is a figure of the Virgen de Guadalupe. So the Virgen de Guadalupe is a manifestation of Mary in the modern Christian Catholic religion. Now, what is fascinating is to kind of point to the picture or the, the white arrow, there's this ribbon around her, her waist, which is a, a symbol of her being pregnant. The Virgen de Guadalupe appeared in Mexico after the arrival of the Spaniards in 1531 there was uh, a peasant by the name of Juan Diego who was near Mexico City at this hill where there was an apparition, there was a, um, so there was a manifestation of uh, the Virgen de Guadalupe who appeared and he was sort of told to go tell the, the Spanish priests and the, the leaders of this manifestation. So the reason I'm mentioning this is because um, that's sort of like the beginning of the, uh, of the story of La, La Virgen de Guadalupe. But it's more complicated than that because that same hill where this apparition happened is actually the same hill where Tonantzin was honored, where Tonantzin was uh, prayed to. It, that's the hill of Tepeyac. So you have perhaps a tool where the Spaniards said, well, it's hard for us to convert, you know, the Mexica, the Aztecs. So the Mexica is a name for the uh, for the people who lived in within the Aztec Empire around the the, the the Mexico City. 
So we need to use the same goddesses to sort of bring them to, to Christianity, to Catholicism. So this is not to invoke any religious uh, sort of um, connotations, but this is more to show you the value of Donansin in the indigenous population. Donansin was so important that the Spaniards knew that importance. And so in that same hill where she was honored, they built the temple for Guadalupe. There are parallels. The same band that we see in the Virgen de Guadalupe, we see in Tonantzin. And even the name Guadalupe is, is uh, Nahuatl in, in origin. It uh, has origins in, in indigenous uh, language. So we see these parallels of how important Tonantzin was. And again, separating the religious aspect for a bit, let's just look at what this manifestation of Tonantzin means. So La Virgen de Guadalupe, knowing that there was heavy inspiration from Tonantzin, in fact, they would call her Tonantzin Guadalupe. That was the first sort of uh, way that the, the natives would, would acknowledge uh, La Virgen de Guadalupe. This is the largest pilgrim pilgrimage site of the Americas. I mentioned before, the indigenous were visiting Tonantzin before there was a temple for La Virgen Guadalupe. This had been going on already for a while. So now there is this manifestation that for, um, till this day, people refer to La Virgen de Guadalupe as Tonantzin, and you have this immense following, the third most visited religious site in the world. The title of this article here is Why the Virgen de Guadalupe is More Than a Religious Icon we are now thinking about the role of Tonantzin from, uh, from a gender perspective, the role of woman as a protector and how this is still continued today. So here we have a manifestation of an indigenous goddess that is still honored today. So I wanna sort of point to this hierarchy. If we, interpret what I've been saying, women and children play a central role. They play sort of the apex role in a society. So the value system is very unique. Elders are central too, but men are sort of on the outskirts. You know, there's not a huge, um, let's say veneration or, or, or fear even amongst God or goddesses as there was for women. And one of the uh, sort of um, examples was through, that I gave was through childbirth and maternal health. So, Donantzin takes on that role as well, because um, you could think of Donantzin as being a representation of this value system. And it's not just the Aztec. This is Kim Anderson, who is uh, a picture of Kim Anderson, who's associate professor of, of indigenous um, studies from Canada. And she says the following quote, indigenous nations differ, but they all share a similar approach with children. Children sit at the core of every traditional native society. They are the heart of our nations. And if you look on the left, we see women and children that are actually sort of in the center of society and men on the outskirts. So the reason why Kim Anderson did this is because she wanted to understand what the social structure was before the arrival of the, um, of the Anglos to the, uh, of Europeans to North America, and of course the Spaniards to uh, Central American and, and Mexico. So we're taking on, what we're showing is that this inherent difference in values. And I mentioned even before that Aztec women had, uh, certainly had, uh, were advanced in, in women's rights compared to, um, to what was going on in Europe at the same time. So we have an inherently different value structure. <laughs> Men at the bottom. <laughs> But let's bring that to today. So this is the movie uh, Coco and the matriarch, the grandmother plays an important role. Why? This is no accident. The producers actually went to Mexico to Guanajuato and Oaxaca and they spent time with families. They wanted to understand what the dynamics were to really put together an authentic movie. So I commend them for that. I think that's really you know insightful from their part. They hired uh, Mexican and Mexican American uh, scholars and artists to really bring this vision to life. And lo and behold, if everything that I've been telling you was about the role of women being at the center, elders, 
then it makes sense that the most, you know, the central um, figure in the movie Coco is a grandmother. So the quote here is Miguel's grandmother based on real world families with whom they embedded, they being the, the team, the, the research team, the, 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 um, the writers while visiting the Mex Mexican states of Oaxaca and Guanajuato. So we see these sort of gender uh, understandings even in modern day. So let's now jump. If we have a basic understanding that perhaps the way that, we, that women were viewed and children were different based upon the maternal health and iconography in pre-Hispanic nations, then what is the current state of Hispanic and indigenous maternal health in the US? So now we're gonna contrast what was then and what is now. I had the pleasure of giving this talk this morning actually for society. So uh, I'm an anesthesiologist or annual society is the, America, the um, American Society of Anesthesiologists. And my topic was maternal morbidity and mortality and racial disparities uh, in the United States. And unfortunately, we have a situation in the United States where Black and Indigenous women are dying at a much higher rate than their white counterparts. So we have mortality, mortality for Black women three to four times higher, American Indian, Alaskan Native women two to three times more likely to die. And if we look at data from, this data from Blue Shield, Blue Cross, they examined 2.2 million births. This is recent data from 2018 to 2020. If women lived in majority black communities that had a 63% higher chance of developing complications, which is um, the term that is used in OB in obstetrics is severe maternal morbidity, SMM, which is unexpected and organ dysfunction. Women in majority Hispanic communities had a 32% higher rate of, SM, of severe maternal morbidity than their white counterparts. So I'm from California. My parents moved to a, a farming, my dad was a farmer, actually also worked around farms in Salinas. For those of you, Salinas is a far, farming community in Northern California. So let's compare the rates of ARDS, sepsis and intubation in pregnancy in a majority Hispanic uh, zip code like Salinas and also compare, uh, compare that to uh, a majority white zip code. And then let's look at the population in Baltimore, Maryland, which is a predominantly African-American zip code and compare that to white, uh, majority white zip codes. So Salinas, I believe is 70% um, uh, Hispanic Latinx and Baltimore is more than 70% um, black. So let's compare that. How, how does that stack compared to majority white uh, zip codes? 112% higher prevalence of ARDS. 100% higher prevalence of sepsis, 102% higher intubation, 138% higher incidence of ARDS for predominantly black um, zip codes, sepsis 157% intubations 145%. So we have these clear disparities that are staring at us. And this is one of the major problems for you medical students out there to really address is why these, uh, understand the social structures behind these disparities. Now, it's important being mentioned that this study here was not looking specifically at Salinas or Baltimore. These are just two examples, two cities that are predominantly Latino, predominantly uh, black. But this is uh, sort of the state of modern black, indigenous, Hispanic maternal health. What are Mexican women, what are Hispanic women saying? So this is a fantastic, um, uh, fantastic work that was done by maternal health uh, researchers where they asked Mexican born women in the US their experiences in delivering. And themes unfortunately that were negative came up. Two of those themes were patients felt invisible and unheard. Here it is different. Maybe if they scream, they will come. I mean, these are just, you can hear the pain through these, um, through these quotes. So Hispanic indigenous women, black women are calling for help. If this is nothing more than, this is a call for help. And if we understand what was in the respect for maternal health and what it is in racial disparities, then we should have at least part of that answer. What's 
really unfortunate about this paper of uh, that sh was asking Mexican women about their experience was that all the participants shifted the conversation towards feeling excluded and isolated. So there was a theme that emerged. Again, how would the Aztecs view this? Separating the religious side, you can think of a doctor who cares as a patient as a donancin, as a spirit of protector. That's the point. The point was that there was a community that rallied around pregnant women, where women didn't feel excluded. That was, to me, one of the representations of, of, of why Donatine is important, because you have this, this sort of society values that are structured around the ultimate sort of protection of maternal health. I can't help but feel, you know, would those feelings be the same if there was sort of a similar um, value structures in place. The spirit of support is missing. So what can we do in modern day? What can you do as a medical student? What can you do as aspiring medical students, doctors? Well, our ancestors live through us. We are a manifestation of our ancestors. And you might be asking, well, how is that Dr. Padilla? You know, how, what do you mean our ancestors live through us? Oh, that happened. Well, you're only gonna learn history through a certain context, you, it, it, you're only gonna learn history through a certain context um, of who it is taught by. So you really have to dig in and read and understand. This is part of the, what I'm trying to give to you all of why our ancestors lived through us. Oh, here's the Dia de los Muertos. This is still celebrated today. So Dia de los Muertos is an incredibly religious holiday that honors the dead. The dead are with us. The dead are alive with us. And think about what the Aztec said in the moment of birth or the moment of pregnancy. It, the life was a manifestation of ancestors. This is very similar in its representation. And this is a holiday that was celebrated by the Aztecs that is still celebrated today. Dia de los Muertos. You guys may have eaten pozole. Pozole is a food, it's a stew that we grew up eating. Every Sunday was pozole. <laughs> it comes from the Aztec empire. The word pozole, a food that was eaten then, that is eaten now. And the name that I mentioned earlier, Sibacuatl, which is also has sort of the same uh, uh, the meaning or manifestation of stonancing also comes up in different aspects. So this is a fantastic lecture by Dr. Uh, Barax from Mexico. This is through the National Institute of Anthropology and History where they actually make this connection of Cihuacuatl, Donantzin to La Llorona. So La Llorona is a, um, a legend that sort of passed along uh, very central to Mexican sort of uh, folklore of a woman who roams the streets crying at night. The story of La Llorona actually dates back to the Aztec Empire and uh, to these uh, 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 goddesses, Donantzin and Sihuacuatl. And these are things that still my grandma told me about La Llorona. So it's just very impressive how when you think about it, we're eating the same food, we're celebrating the same holidays, and we're honoring the same goddesses on different names. So then it begs the question, if we celebrate the same holidays, eat the same food, honor the same female goddesses, then we must have the same lens through which we view the world. And I really want you to think about that for a second, because think about what I have been talking about and your family structure. How are, what is the subtle, even subconscious way that we look at our grandmothers? You know, it's very central to our family. These are things that are passed along. They don't have to be said, they're just passed along in richness and tradition. Don Ancin lives even through the modern uh, um, United Farm Workers uh, struggle, Cesar Chavez. Don Ancin, the Virgen de Guadalupe is a central figure of identity in modern Hispanic, in beyond Mexican Hispanic uh, uh, heritage. This is from 
a few months ago in Mexico. This is a protest, a sign of a protest against um, thermoelectric industrialization in Mexico. Donancy in Guadalupe, this is today modern political resistance, if you will, resistance to industrialization being invoked by an Aztec goddess. This is fascinating, right? Because we know through this lecture that the role of Donati was central to maternal health. And just a few months ago, Mexico built a replica of an Aztec temple to commemorate 500 years since the Spanish conquest. They weren't happy, but they did, want to they did not want to focus on the Spanish conquest, right? As victors, but the soul of what was Mexico, the richest of Mexico, which is the indigenous roots. And at Stanford, where I am, there is also this, uh, just recently, this is a few days ago, there was um, a call by the uh, university to honor the land and to really put efforts with local tribes, the Ohlone uh, a tribe of, of native indigenous uh, peoples in Northern California um, to honor the land that, that, sits, uh, that the university sits on. So we see this respect even you know, several hundred years later coming through. So then let's put it all together. What does this mean, right? Separating the religious sort of aspect from it, we have iconography that symbolizes the importance of maternal health. The most iconic female figure in Latin America is a symbol of maternal health. So it begs the question, is this a representation of a religious symbol or is this a symbol of maternal health? And let's go back to our, uh, our research uh, of experiences of Mexican women. And I want you to pay attention to these words. This is what a patient said in, that, in this work. In my town, in Mexico, my mom, when a baby is born, my grandma, a community midwife, partera, took care of me and them. And she doesn't let them get up, meaning uh, women that just had babies. And they bring food to the bed. They wash your hands with warm water. They change you, comb your hair, everything. But here, who's going to help me? Nobody but myself. Look at these words, guys. Grandma, central, woman, elders, central in society, community, rallying, midwives, sacred. <laughs> yes, by Mayan and Aztec standards, midwives were sacred. Yes, warm water, heat. These are things that are passed along. And then we look at the food that we eat and we look at the holidays that we celebrate. It's, it's, it's very interesting when we put all this together. And so what can we do? You know, I propose if there's any educators out there in, in, in medical education listening is we have to teach medical anthropology. Medical anthropology is the heart. It, it, we change the heart of future doctors by teaching the history of surrounding communities, especially these communities are suffering disproportionately like black, indigenous and native uh, you know, his, Hispanic uh, communities. We need to teach medical anthropology, create holistic family centered environment for, uh, for Hispanic women where elders and matriarchs are respected, fund programs for Spanish speaking midwives, especially knowing the historical importance and ed educational resources for Hispanic patients pipeline programs for underserved students, Mi Mentor Alliance and Mentorship. This is exactly the type of work that is going to change and going to bring a more just field of medicine in the future. And then there are certain fields where I feel an enormous amount of, of, um, of sort of purpose and fulfillment, such as obstetric anesthesia. Representation matters. I wanna just share with you this quick story. So this happened, uh, in residency, I was on Univision. And this is really before I took a deep dive into Aztec and Mayan sort of indigenous history. So this is um, before that understanding, but I, I still kind of knew how important childbirth was in our culture and, and how things were sort of, uh, uh, you know, at least manifested for my, like what my grandmother would say. So I was at doing an interview for Univision and I talked about the safety of epidurals because epidurals, are not only safe, but in high-risk women, an epidural can actually prevent complications. But unfortunately, Hispanic women do not receive epidurals because there's not enough uh, Spanish education and there's not enough, really, frankly, I think one of the reasons there's not enough 
uh, Hispanic Latinx doctors really putting this out there, the safety. So I was on Univision and uh, the host is someone who had, uh, she had just had twin babies, not that like two months before. And when I was done with the interview, she was like, she came up to me and all the producers that were women who were like filming and they all came up to me, they're like, oh my God, like, like, that was really good because what I talked about was the role of, of how we need to, as medical professionals, we need to respect the elders in the room. It's always about the patient, but we have to respect the abuelitas, the tias in the room. We know the role that they play. And they were all like, yes, I identify with what you said. And I'm like, oh my God, like I, I felt it because I knew that in my instinct, but it was one of the first times that like, it all just kind of makes sense. It clicked in my mind, I was like, yes the role of the matriarchs are so key. It's so key in Hispanic health. So let's go back to that farm where my great grandmother died. Was this a story that was sort of, you know, subconsciously passed along to me with, with great importance because of the historic, because of the, the cultural significance of, of, of maternal health? It was certainly a story that influenced me, but perhaps I didn't even know how much. Did it influence me to go into obstetric anesthesia critical care? I don't know. And this is this is the magic of who we are and discovering who we are. And I really just ask all of you to really understand your history, your local history, the history of our peoples, the history of indigenous um, contributions to, to health and modern science. The answer is in our history. I absolutely stand behind the statement. And I just want to give a shout out to the mentors who have helped me along the way. Maria Ramirez, my college counselor, community advocate, my Tonantzin, <laughs> my, you know, soul guardian, <laughs> you know, who's out there taking care of me and never gave up on me. She actually gave a talk today on 500 years of resistance, a counter narrative of Hispanic to Hispanic heritage, really bringing, so it's just fascinating. She sparked that fire in me. And uh, Dr. Santalina Marrero, Dr. Santalina Marrero is, um, mother of a friend of mine who was just a great advocate, someone who was always there for me. The role of women, of course, my mother, my grandmother, no question, the role of women is central. Again, the role of women in being leaders in my uh, identity, in my education, in my inspiration. So what can you do? What else? Join us. I am the co-chair of the National Hispanic Medical Association's uh, inaugural Council of Anesthesia. We start, we're going to start this. It's going to launch in January 2022. But if you're interested in addressing disparities in, in the Hispanic community in obstetrics, reach out to me, email me. This would be awesome. We have a leadership council of anesthesia that are experts all around the country. And think about what I said and the following statement. We want to, we, one of my goals is to prevent Hispanic, Spanish speaking women from feeling isolated in the, in, the, in the hospital place. And I think we can achieve that. One of the ways that we do that is by partnering with our medical societies, with our educational societies, and really, you know, making, um, you know, providing better care for our, our communities, our communities that are suffering, our communities that feel ignored, our communities where we could be spirits of, of support. And that is it. Please, any questions, I'm going to stop sharing. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Padilla, for sharing all that insight. It's definitely something I never really thought of that much into, for sure. So it's super interesting um, to hear it from where it even originated. Um, but if anyone has any questions, now is the time. You can also just leave it in the chat and maybe we can address it later. Please, any questions? Yes. Or comments. <laughs> mm -hmm. Everyone's going to join the NHMA, right? <laughs> well, let me put my email. I'll put, I'll put my email in the... Thank you. Um, some action in the chat. Yeah. Yeah. Putting your email in the chat can, would be helpful. Mm -hmm. You guys have the answers to providing a better care in the future. It comes within you. Okay. If there's oh, no thank you. 
questions. Um, we're gonna transition. Oh, okay. So we have one question. Could you go into the oh. detail about your comment, like your being connected to maternity? Great question. So, so um, maternal health is represented in Donanti and in Siwakwatl. So remember I said Donanti is Mother Earth and a personality, if you will, of Donanti was Siwakwatl. Siwakwatl was the goddess of the midwife um, as well. So these terms are sort of used, inter I don't want to say interchangeably, but there's at least evidence of a codex where they refer to Donanti as, as Siwakwatl. Siwakwatl could also take, take on a manifestation of, of, um, of a snake woman, a woman who was, um, who was angry, sad. And there are these details of a crying woman that happened before the arrival of the Spanish where she was crying on the streets. She was crying because uh, she felt like the end of the empire was coming. This is fascinating. This is in 15, oh, this is before the arrival of the Spanish. And the leaders were so uh, distraught and, um, it was Moctezuma. So Moctezuma, who's the emperor, was like, what is happening? And all the priests were like, that's Siwakuatl. Siwakuatl is out there roaming the streets, warning of something to come. And uh, that was written in the codexes and, and drawn out. And so really the connection comes from a cry woman who's roaming the streets and had sort of this ghostly figure to the modern manifestations of, of, of La Llorona, which is this woman who's roaming the streets and sort of crying. Um, now, the reasons why still was crying, the modern, you know, interpretation is because the children, her children uh, uh, died or, or she killed her children, but that, regardless, there's that connection that comes in from the history. So it's a good question. So, I'm wondering, yeah, hi. Hi, um, I work in OB, GYN at Stanford. <gasps> so no way. I'm gonna, I'm gonna connect with you. Um, do you know Catherine Bianco? You must know her. One of our I heard the name. Yes. Well, anyway, we're we're starting to um, work on a QI project to at least get in in person interpreters back into L and D without not the iPad, making it a QI project. And I would love to have you come and do this talk, either for a grand rounds next year or to our to. Uh, I'm so excited. I'm absolutely so excited that I got an email about this from, uh, I'm a liaison to the OFDD. And um, anyway, so you are all so blessed to have heard this and um, anthropology and history is super important in understanding where people have come from. Um, I'm Scottish, they have terrible food. I don't know what they do. But, <laughs> uh, <laughs> But um, if there's any students here that are at Stanford and might be interested in our uh, special interest group in OB, um, OBGYN, I'll put my email in the chat. And um, anyway, Dr. Padilla, thank you so much. And, and I will contact you. <laughs> thank you. Yep, you have my email. There's a few more questions. Do I have time to answer them or no? Or no, sorry, Dr. Padilla. Um, okay. No, 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 no worries. You guys can email me the people, yeah. in the Oscar Casares and Mayra Reyes. Yeah. Okay. Um, that'd be helpful because we do have a, a Q and A panel coming up next. <laughs> so thank you so much again. Um, but I'll go ahead and introduce our pre medical students, um, Oscar Casares, who's also one of the people who asked you the question. Yesenia Buenrostro Ramirez and Vanessa Alvarado. They're all three uh, pre-medical students who are gonna be part of our Q&A panel. We also have um, three medical students, Aldana Garcia, who is a medical student at Michigan State University since 2020. We have Eileen Arevalo, who is a fourth year medical student at UCLA, part of the Charles Drew program. And we have Adan Garcia Messinas at AT Still University um, for the School of Osteopathic Medicine. So we can go ahead and open the floor um, to any general question, um, questions that any of the participants have for them. They are all pre-medical and medical students who identify as Hispanic or Latino, um, so they can Introduce themselves if they'd like. Um, I, I can't really see everyone because 
I'm like sharing my screen. Oh, but Vanessa, do you want to go ahead and, and start and introduce yourself? Thanks. Yeah. Hi, everyone. My name is Vanessa Alvarado. I am a ex external president of uh, the Southern California region for Mimentor this year. And I've been working with Mimentor since 2018 or like working since 2020, but uh, part of the actual organization. And I'm a non-traditional student. I grew up in a single parent immigrant household in the San Fernando Valley area. And then I went to community college after high school and transferred to UCLA after that. So taking some gap years before applying to medical school, but if you have any questions or if your journey kind of resonates mine, you can feel free to ask me any sort of questions. I'll be happy to answer them. I'll go ahead and jump on that. <laughs> Thank you, Vanessa. So hello everyone, my name is Yesenia Buenrostro Ramirez. Um, I'm actually from the Central Valley, Fresno, California. Um, I just graduated in 2020 from Fresno State. Um, I'm currently taking some gap years. I have to finish some prereqs. Um, I've been a part of Mimento for two years now as ambassador, now as VP of Outreach, great organization. Um, I love all the work we do. Um, Oh, I see Myra 555 and present. Yeah, Central Valley is amazing. <laughs> um, but yeah, so um, I actually have a really non-traditional path. Um, but yeah, feel free to ask me any questions. Okay, then that's my turn now. So I'm Oscar Casares. I am a senior at uh, UTRGB. I am a double major in biology and psychology, and I have a minor in medical humanities. As of now, I am a national leader for AMSA. I serve as the Wellness and Student Life Programming Coordinator. And I was actually the one who thought about having an event for AMSA um, regarding Hispanic, Her Hispanic Heritage Month. And uh, Courtney was the one who asked, uh, who thought about collaborating with me and thought for the event. And um, you can take it now, <clears throat> Jade. Um, I'll, I'll done now or Eileen, anybody can go ahead and introduce himself. <laughs> I'll go ahead. So my name is Aldana Garcia. I'm, a, uh, I'm actually from Argentina. I was born and raised there, both of my parents. Um, and I moved to um, Santa Ana, California when I was nine, went to UCLA for undergrad and took four gap years, uh, did a lot of different um, mentorship. I've been part of my mentor for I think this is my fourth or fifth year. I lost track, but uh, it's something I'm very passionate about and uh, it's wonderful to see so many familiar faces here. And um, yeah, feel free to ask any questions. I'm an open book. And I am now a second year at Michigan State University College of Human Medicine. I'm in the MD program. Um, so yeah, if you have any questions about going out of state or anything like that, feel free to ask away. Guess I can go next. Hi everyone, my name's Elena Revelo. Um, I currently attend UCLA per the Drew program. I am technically a fourth year, but I'm actually taking a leave of absence to do research. And so I'm currently in that right now, but otherwise,